Hey physics students, Campbell here. In our first video on modern physics, I'm going to talk about the photon theory of light. Now, a little disclaimer here. I have things a little out of order. Um, in fact, I talk about Einstein's three basic postulates of photon theory before I talk about the photoelectric effect. In fact, the photoelectric effect came first and Einstein using the photoelectric effect results is how he came up with these three basic postulates. But so a little sequencing difference, but all the information is spot on. So let's get to it. Now in our last unit in optics, we talked about how light is a wave and it shows wave properties like interference and diffraction. Those are definitely wave properties. But we run other experiments and light behaves like a particle. And this particle like nature is called photons. So is it a wave? Is it a particle? Is it both? Well, we're going to find out in this unit. Now, why do we think light has this photon or particle like behavior? Well, one experiment, which is totally cool in a photograph, if we have change our light intensity. Now light intensity is like how bright the light is. It's its power per unit area. At a very low intensity, we see only spots. So instead of like a full just image that's dimmer, we actually just see individual dots like a particle. But if we increase the intensity of the light, we get more dots until we have enough to form a fully formed picture, which we would expect to see. Now, if light was just a wave, then reducing that intensity, that power per unit area should just give us a dimmer image, not a spotty image. Crazy. Now, this and other evidence like the photoelectric effect we're going to talk about in a bit, Einstein came up with three postulates for photon theory. He really believed that light was a particle. And his postulates say that one, electromagnetic waves consist of discrete massless particles that he called photons traveling at the speed of light. Massless is very important. Massless particles. Photons are massless particles. You can't use mass in any equation when you're calculating a photon. The energy of that particle is actually related to the frequency of its oscillation. Yes, these particles oscillate like waves. And the energy equation is the energy is equal to H, which is Planck's constant, 6.626 times 10 to the negative 34th joule seconds, times that frequency. Now remember in our optics unit, we were talking about the velocity, what I call the velocities for lambda equation. Velocity is equal to frequency times wavelength. So we can substitute in speed and wavelength into this equation um, for frequency and then it becomes Planck's constant times the speed of light travels at the speed of light divided by the wavelength of our photon. Now when I have lots of photons, so bright light, high intensity, large number of photons, I actually get the appearance of a continuous wave. Particle waves, what? Crazy! Now if light is a photon then there are a couple things that could happen. One, when it undergoes interactions with matter like atoms and electrons, well, if photons have enough energy, they could knock an electron out of an atom. That's actually called the photoelectric effect, and we're going to talk about it first. But what if it doesn't get absorbed? What if it kind of just bounces off of it? Well, if it bounces off of it, it will lose some energy. So that means its frequency and wavelength will change, and that's called the Compton effect. Photons, if their energy, can produce matter. And we're going to see in class that photons can produce electron-positron pairs. Not that we're going to be making them. We're going to be talking about them in class. Or maybe instead of being absorbed and ejecting electron, maybe it doesn't have enough energy to do that. Maybe it just gives its energy to an electron and promotes it to a higher state. Hmm. We're going to talk about that in another video. All right, so let's talk about the first one, the photoelectric effect. This was observed by Heinrich Hertz in 1887. Wait, wasn't that when Michelson and Morley were doing their experiment? Kind of interesting. What he found was that when he shined light on a metal, he could actually knock electrons out of the atoms. What? What? 
So obviously the light must have enough energy to overcome attraction of the electron to the nucleus. If you remember back in chemistry when you talked about ionization energy, ionization energy was the energy required to remove an electron, one of those valence electrons from an atom. Well, light must have enough energy to do that. So what's, what he found was that shining light on a metal, we'll call it our cathode, here it comes, if it has enough energy, it'll eject electrons. And those electrons will travel over to the anode. They'll do that if I set up a little uh, battery here and I make this anode positive so that the electrons are attracted to it. So instead of the electrons just you know moving around at random, they'll actually travel right over to that anode. And then if this is a wire, right, my ammeter here is going to detect current, right? The flow of electrons is current. So light shine on a metal ejects electrons and my ammeter detects current. Interestingly enough, the person who explained the photoelectric effect was Einstein in 1905. Wait, that's when he came up with his two postulates of special relativity. Oh, crazy. Now, what Einstein found and wrote about, he actually published a paper on this, he showed that the presence of the current depends upon the light's frequency. So it must exceed some minimum frequency, we call it the threshold frequency or F sub naught, in order for current to appear. If the frequency is too low, then I don't get any current at all. So I must have enough energy. The value of this threshold frequency is dependent on the metal of the cathode. Now that should make sense, right? Because each metal has a different ionization energy. So they'll all require a different amount of energy to knock electrons out. We call that amount of energy the work function of the metal, or W naught. The work function of the metal is the amount of energy required to remove an electron, like ionization energy. Now, one thing that was really interesting is as soon as light above that frequency or at that threshold frequency, just above it, is applied, current appears. It doesn't matter how bright the light is, how intense it is, as long as I have the right amount of frequency, I will detect current. But how bright the light is does depend upon how much current I get. So intensity is related to the amount of current, but not whether or not I get current. Now, in this setup, with the battery positioned this way and the anode positive, it doesn't matter what voltage I have here. Like if I can dial up voltage, it doesn't make a difference how much, that does not affect the amount of current hitting the anode at all. However, if I flip the battery so that I give this anode a slightly negative charge, then as I increase the voltage, I can actually stop the current. That's called the stopping voltage or V-stop. Now, if you think about it, if you remember back to electrostatics, which seems like a long time ago now, um, we have electric potential energy, which is equal to Q times the voltage. So the stopping voltage is providing energy to stop the electrons. Now, if let's talk about energy. Conservation of energy says that that incoming light, which Einstein defined as Planck's constant times the frequency must equal the work function of the metal, right, the energy to remove an electron, plus whatever kinetic energy it has to cross across that path from cathode to anode. So our equation for the photoelectric effect is energy initial has to equal energy final. So the incoming energy of my photon, HF, has to equal the work function of the metal plus whatever kinetic energy it has, one half mv squared. Now that means the threshold frequency itself times Planck's constant is equal to the work function, right? I have to have that minimum amount in order to get that electron to get out of the atom. Now, if I only have that frequency, it's not gonna go anywhere. It just has enough energy to get out, but then it can't go. So we can also write a threshold wavelength equation and say that the work function is also equal to h times c, the speed of light, divided by the threshold wavelength. So this is a statement of the law of conservation of energy. So let's look at this equation again in terms of the stopping potential. So remember that the stopping potential is the voltage that just stops 
those electrons from getting over to this anode. That means that the stopping voltage, if we write it in terms of potential energy, Q times V, then when Q times V is equal to the kinetic energy that those electrons have, they will never make it here. So I can rewrite the equation so that the energy in, HF, is equal to the energy out, the work function of the metal, plus the stopping voltage times Q, right? That's the potential energy. So when the potential energy, QV, is equal to the kinetic energy of the electrons, then they stop. Now I can rearrange this equation and solve for the stopping voltage, which means I gotta put Q there. So I have H over Q times F minus work function over Q. Hmm, doesn't that kind of look like a Y is equal to MX plus B equation? Guess what that means? Graphs! So we can actually plot the stopping voltage versus frequency and we will get a nice linear slope. And that slope is Planck's constant divided by the charge on an electron. So if I take the slope and I multiply by 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19, I'm gonna get Planck's constant in joules. Cool. Now, another pretty cool thing about this graph is that this x-intercept here is the threshold frequency. So if I give you a graph and I say, what's the threshold frequency? Just find out where it crosses the x-axis. And what about where it crosses the y-axis, right? Y is equal to mx plus b. So where it crosses in that y-axis is going to be the negative of the work function divided by the charge. Huh, pretty cool. Now, we could also generate a graph of kinetic energy versus frequency. We're going to get the same exact thing, but then we don't have to worry about the whole Q thing. So if we go back to that original equation where HF is equal to the work function plus the kinetic energy, um, we could rearrange that and plot a graph and we would also get a slope that gives us Planck's constant. So guess what that means? You're going to be doing some graphing. Now, photon energies are teeny tiny. So we like to express them in terms of another term because we like big numbers. We don't like these teeny tiny numbers. And that's called an electron volt, symbolized by an EV. Symbol for an electron, right? E, elementary particle, EV. What, what an electron volt is, is the energy of an electron that's been accelerated through a potential difference or a voltage of one. So the conversion factor, right, would be Q, 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19th, right? That's the charge on an electron, times one volt, QB energy. So one electron volt is, one, is the same as a charge on an electron in joules. So let's do some math. In a photoelectric effect experiment, we find that current doesn't flow unless the wavelength is less than 570 nanometers. So what is the work function of this material? Pause the video and see if you can get this correct and then put it in electron volts. Well, if we do the math, right, we're looking at the work function um, related to the threshold frequency, or in this case, the threshold wavelength. So work function is Planck's constant times the speed of light divided by the wavelength. We do that and then we have to, that would be in joules. And then we have to convert it to electron volts. So we got to divide by 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19th. If you did that correctly, you should get 2.18 electron volts. So that is the work function of my metal in electron volts. Now, what is the stopping voltage if I use a wavelength of 400 nanometers? All right, so we're going to use conservation of energy here. We now know what the work function of the metal is. So the HC over lambda, that incoming energy, has to equal the work function plus Q times the stopping voltage. So pause the video, see if you can figure out the stopping voltage. All right, if you did this right, our equation, if we take our energy that, uh, of the incoming photon, HC over lambda, and subtract out our work function, that'll give us uh, the stopping voltage Q times Q. So let's do some math. So if we plug in our numbers and again convert to electron volts, if we subtract that from the work function in electron volts, we're going to get 0.93 electron volts. Well, so what is that in terms of stopping voltage? <laughs> 
Guess what? Remember that an electron volt is the energy of an electron when accelerated through a potential difference of one volt. So if I do a little conversion here, one volt is per one electron volt, huh, it's just 0.93 volts. Another reason why it's cool to work in electron volts. My conversion is real simple. All right, so 0.93 volts. How'd you do? Okay, so let's look in more detail at why the photoelectric effect demonstrates the photon theory of light. Let's look at it, if light was a wave, then what the theory would say is that the number of electrons and their energy should increase as we increase the intensity of the light. As we increase the brightness of the light, we would get more electrons with more energy, right? Because intensity is power over area for a wave. And so frequency wouldn't matter. And if light is a particle, then increasing the intensity would increase the number of electrons, but not their energy, because increasing intensity means I'm just putting more photons out there. So intensity isn't energy, it's the number of particles, the number of rocks I'm throwing at the surface, not their energy. So increasing the number of photon particles intensity increases the number of ejected electrons. And above a threshold energy, a minimum energy required to break that bond between the electron and the nucleus, then kinetic energy would increase linearly as I increase frequency because Einstein said that the energy of a photon is Planck's constant times frequency. So frequency goes up, energy goes up, which means kinetic energy would go up. And then there also has got to be some sort of cutoff frequency, right? Because that would be a cutoff energy below which no electrons would be emitted, regardless of how bright the light was. Well, as you saw, that's what we get. If we plot kinetic energy or stopping voltage, either one, versus the frequency of the light, we can see that there's a threshold there is a minimum. It doesn't matter how bright the light is. As long as that we haven't exceeded the threshold, we get nothing. And as we increase the frequency, now I have more energy, so I get more kinetic energy, which I can measure by measuring the stopping voltage. Now, one thing about the particle theory is it assumes that each individual electron absorbs one single photon. And that's why when we increase the intensity or the number of electrons, sorry, the number of photons, I get more electrons. So the data that we see when we run the photoelectric experiment shows clear agreement with the photon theory of light, not the wave theory. Now, that leads me to some questions, and these are your WSQs. WSQ1, what happens to the rate of electrons that are emitted when I increase the brightness? Rate, remember, would be the number of electrons per second. Does it increase, and why, or does it not? Question number two, what happens to the maximum kinetic energy when I increase the brightness over the intensity? Does it increase? And why? Or does it not change at all? Ah, you're not done. There's two more WSQs. WSQ3, what happens to the rate, so the number of electrons per second, that are emitted when the frequency of light increases? Does it increase or doesn't change? And why? And question four, what happens to the maximum kinetic energy when the frequency of light increases? Does it increase or does it not change? And why? All right. Finish your WSQ and I'll see you in class.